Uh, my title is like Future Robotics. I mean, uh, I like to talk about where our robotics should go and then how we actually learn to that transformation. So this is actually the uh, biggest like a vision uh, for us. So the robotics has been very useful for making things very fast. Very accurately, you can assemble uh, uh, small chips and uh, P PCB with using a very accurate, very rapid uh, robots. So most of these robots are uh, designed to be fast and accurate and uh, repeatable. So and and both robots are, are designed for are working uh, in a in a factory. So those are all in the uh, very heavily grounded. So they most robots are not uh, capable of moving around. But think about this has been uh, several decades is already technology technology is already saturating. They're still improving, but we're thinking about using robot for many different applications. The example is Fukushima uh, disaster response. We would like to help human using our robot in, in, in uh, right next to our life, not just the uh, restrain the uh, factory. So um, uh, uh, what are the differences? It's actually, the uh, we um, uh, how do we build uh, manufacturing robots are very very different from how we should build a mobile robot that we can actually use for digest response or human assistive or new transportation because these are not necessarily uh, uh, designed it has to be designed to do accurate uh, motions like when you think about I'm moving talking in front of you I don't really care how much my foot is like a millimeter off or half a millimeter off I don't really care so accuracy is not most more important you should be more compliant you should be able to uh, balance yourself so the force control is way more important then actually position control and then compliance control is actually way more important than make things as stiff as possible. So a lot of things should be different. You should navigate, you should be able to balance, you should be able to apply forces without losing your balance. Very different uh, uh, your, the design paradigm should be applied. So my approach is that well, we should learn from biology because that's what biology does. You know, no, no, no biologist, no biological uh, uh, organism actually does this kind of thing. The most biologists are expert in, in locomotion. They move around. Their mo locomotion is actually essential part of their life for survival. So uh, recently, there are many. This is actually a little outdated. There are probably even better robots. But this is a, 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 a few collections of my favorite robots. Uh, and they're excellent uh, uh, examples of bio-inspired robots. So there are many, many different examples. But how do they design this? That's my question. When they when, when you ask them like oh like a, a fly robot from Robwood like uh, do they how do they build they look at the micro a fly and then take it apart and oh that's how it looks and then I'm gonna copy in the, uh, in our engineering domain that's not how they work right so if you look at take a look at details they're actually very different same for snake robot same for big dog same for Ashimo if you take a look at inside how they really design their robots it's actually quite different from us how do we actually design these things uh, but like we we learned uh, 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 right information from nature. That's my biggest question and then try to understand how you do this. So, for example, uh, I can give you an example of an animal, like for example a cheetah robot. I look at the cheetah and wow, it's really, really fast. They're the fastest running animal. And then, huh, I'm going to take a look at their limbs and skins and tails, everything. Every aspect must be designed for running fast. Wait a second, they are not just designed for running, right? They have to eat, they have to digest, they have to keep their temperature against the environment, and then they have to uh, also evolve. So, like, let for, say, for example, like uh, five leg is better for running, and then you cannot just have a five leg for the next sibling, right? You, can, you have to you know, res, uh, remain inside the evolution. Like, uh, like an engineer, we don't care actually about en evolution. Our evolution is much, much more drastic. I can make a six leg robot today, I can make an eight leg robot uh, tomorrow. Even number, all number, doesn't matter, right? But the animal design process are not that uh, free. They actually have to re, uh, uh, stay in this evolution process. Uh, there's so much, I cannot even ex uh, uh, come up with all these examples. And then the role animals are designed to meet all these requirements. And then a uh, naive engineer, wow, I'm going to copy everything and it must run like a cheetah. That's a very, very naive thought, right? And then if you take a look at robotics, even though, let's say, I found out that A, B, C, D features are the best for the uh, running, well, we, our building blocks are very, very different. We don't have uh, things like muscle. We, well, I'm going to talk about it actually later, but we don't have artificial muscle exactly like uh, running like muscle. Our computer is uh, completely different from how I actually run my brain right now, talking to you, balancing myself, using my arms. We don't understand actually how we do this. 
uh, our, our energy source is also very different. We're furiously looking for uh, fuel cell to come out so we can make uh, electric systems more uh, uh, useful and then more uh, efficient. And more importantly, actually, the uh, uh, application is different. We're not interested in making a robot and then just it's free in the nature to make it survive, right? We have our own application in mind. I'm interested in making robots that can go over uh, obstacles and uh, the stairs and uh, rubbles, and then you can save lives, open the door, close the valve. Or we can make a robot that can actually uh, carry uh, uh, elderly people who cannot move around, or somebody who lost the sensation of the uh, spinal cord. I want to make a robot that can go over uh, uh, certain places and then do some tasks. Not necessarily uh, doing all the tasks what nature biologist does. So uh, how do we actually transfer the knowledge from biology to robotics to make our robot better? It's actually quite an intricate problem. Um, especially if you, if you take a look at other bio-inspired uh, uh, engineering, like surface chemistry or topology or some other simpler example, I think the learning curve is actually pretty simple. When it comes to robot, it's way more complex because it's a more integrated system. So this is a typical process we do. Uh, it's still very abstract, but uh, you can think about what is the role of biology in the process, uh, design process of robot. If you have uh, some sort of goal, we design a robot, and then we test, and then we learn from the test, and then redesign it. That's what a typical engineering process. What is the biologist's role? We actually need to extract the principle, not just copying, not just like uh, uh, looking at every feature as, as if like a gospel. We have to really take a look at it as a crit critical view and then extract the very abstract uh, principle, and then we can implement. For example, if you want to make a running robot, you have to look at many different running animals, not just cheetah, because there is common principle uh, is, uh, is, uh, embodied in, uh, in the many different running animals. So you have to extract that uh, uh, principle from many different running animals using comparative biologists, and then we can build a robot that not necessarily look like animal, and then we can test our hypothesized principle is correct or not. And sometimes uh, uh, we can refine the principle, and then sometimes we, our uh, 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 result actually inspire biology. Uh, biologists, biologists take a look at, oh, engineers use tail, and oh, you have to take a look at tail. And then there's a mutual inspiration that can happen. Very exciting area. Um, so I want to uh, show you a couple of examples. This is one of the first uh, robot I built. Uh, actually using compliance. So this is a sort of like embodiment of the spring load inverter pendulum uh, um, uh, model that we learned from uh, insect running and many different animals running. This is uh, uh, called the ice pro. It's a running on a treadmill. It's hard to see. Um, if you see the real speed, uh, it's running pretty well. Um, it's about palm size, about 30, 300 gram robot. And it, it, you use, uh, it runs about 15 body lengths per second. But it cannot do anything else. It cannot climb. If you, we, we say that it's cockroach into a robot. It cannot climb, cannot Whoa. eat, cannot digest. Why? Because we only uh, implement the principle for running. So it only does running only on the hard ground. It cannot even run on the sand. Because we only implement Ready, that go. specific principle. Uh, but it, it, it is a good example how we actually implement only the principle of running and then uh, uh, re-implement uh, in our engineering domain, not necessarily uh, copying uh, biology. Another example, this is one of the fascinating examples. Um, uh, Gecko used this complex nanoscale uh, hierarchical structure to create Van der Waals force uh, and then stick almost any surfaces. There are a couple of uh, even more uh, strange and count sometimes counterintuitive factors. It sticks, but it slides and still sticks. Uh, we call it dynamic adhesion. And uh, it's self-cleaning. It doesn't get dirty, even though it sticks almost everywhere. If you want any, a, a question, I can answer what I, what I think it is. Most importantly, though, it's directional. What do you mean by directional? Uh, Keller Autumn uh, design, uh, the measure these uh, real gecko hair on the force plate. And then he was, uh, he was trying to measure force and then didn't uh, stick at all. Now I was confused. Wait a second. This hair is from gecko. And then it doesn't stick. It starts sticking once you drag along the surface. Wow, OK, now how it work. And then he does it opposite and it doesn't work. Because actually, that's very important to climbing. So um, this is a sticky bar. We actually implement this idea on actually our microstructure. We, our structures are not nanoscale. 
but look at take a look at the hand, how hands are easily detached from the wall because it is directional. So something like this can adhesion be directional? We didn't even think about that kind of science until we see the nature, nature example. And then, oh wow, that's actually very important for climbing because if you have really sticky foot, it wants to stick to the wall, and then wow, I stick to the wall, but how about detaching? You have to really, oh, you have to detach it. You, can, you, have, you have to have time for that when you're running away from predator, right? So if you look at gecko, actual gecko running on the, up, up the wall, and then uh, running on the ground, if you take a uh, video footage and then take a look at it, they look identical. They look, you cannot tell the difference. So they, uh, that's climbing for them is that easy. I think it's because of the uh, directionality. So uh, this, is, this is a demonstration of directional adhesion we built uh, when I was a grad student. Uh, you can just hang by touching it. If you take weight off, it just comes off. Wait a second, you can do that with the tape. Yes, you can do the tape, but you need to press pretty hard to make it stick because it's a pressure sensitive adhesive. You have to press it. Once you get stick, you have to detach it uh, with the active force. But it doesn't uh, work in the, our uh, directional adhesion. It's a, it purely depends on actually mechanical aspects, the anisotropic uh, geometry. And gecko, we believe that geckos are working the same way, but it's much more complex. So well, let's uh, push, push the limit. How, how can, we, uh, can we hang the heavy weight? So it's a seven kilogram, 15 pound uh, metal. So I was a little bit careful, but see how the glass is, the reflection is not even moving. It hung uh, seven kilogram, and then once it takes the weight, it doesn't even uh, take any detachment force. And then Kella Autumn was excited. He's the biologist. Can I hang my daughter? And then we, we hung her. She was about 55 pounds. Uh, we hung her on the window. Uh, we, we, we tried more than 100 pounds, but we were worrying about the glass, actually. The glass might shatter. But again, once she's out, uh, this, this one just comes off with the pinky. It was actually hanging uh, uh, like 50 pounds or 100 pound weight. But because it's directional, you can actually detach as long as there's no tangential direction force. Fascinating uh, science we learn from biology and then we realize in the engineering domain. Another example, this is a, a mesh worm. Um, we were working uh, a, on a project called a CAMBOT, and then I, I think our uh, target was making a squishy robot. So there's many different names of what our, our project was. Well, let's make a robot soft. So in you know, nature, there's many examples, many animals has uh, very soft bodies, and then uh, wondering how they move. You know, in, in uh, endoskeleton, like of mammals, kind of intuitive. You have a bone, you have a muscle, and the muscle is applying force between the bones, and then, oh, I can move. How do they move? It is there is no bone. And then if you take a look at it, it's quite interesting. So they have a circumferential muscle around the body, and then there's a longitudinal muscle. So if you fire the longitudinal muscle, they contract and then get fatter. And if you fire this uh, circumferential muscle, they contract uh, radially and they get longer because they have a, a liquid inside, so they're uh, pretty much incompressible. Uh, so you can actually have a constant volume. They squeeze body long, elongate, and then move along. It's like a peristalsis. Uh, it's like your how you move your food inside your stomach. Uh, it's kind of opposite here, but uh, so we realized that uh, principle in uh, Chinese finger trap, basically. Um, so, uh, and how, how to apply forces. So these are uh, shape memory alloy coil. So it's hard to see. This is actually about 400 micron in diameter. But within 400 micron, there is actually coil inside. It's a very small shape memory alloy. We can actually fire uh, by controlling a print current through. And then we made a, a called, things called mesh worm. So this is sort of like, uh, um, this is a true per peristalsis. Actual uh, orthodome actually moves slightly differently. But this is exactly how uh, most soft animal uh, crawl. And then that's exactly how you move your uh, food inside your stomach. So we're trying to demonstrate what this is uh, indestructible. I was kind of like uh, careful. And then my student was like, no, no, no. You have to press really hard. And then he happened to be very heavy. So there was another interesting example. Um, uh, this is a current project, so I'm going to talk a little bit longer about our Cheetah project on right now. This is a video from uh, Life of Memo, uh, BBC. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, uh, footage. So this, this is still fascinating because they're like moving like a background. Um, and well, we believe that it can run about 70 miles per hour. This video I've been showing about five years, still fascinating. This is the only video that shows this behavior. So even biologists, we cannot, they cannot study because there's only one data point. 
Um, see this a tail? And uh, we speculate many different hypotheses. Uh, now we have uh, some sort of conclusive answer. Um, the, it, it is too early for us to implement this kind of uh, uh, behavior because it's not for balancing, it's for more rapid turning. Um, so we start this project uh, uh, envisioning uh, like making a robot that can go almost everywhere. And then DARPA was interested in like, so uh, how, how good our legacy system is. Once your legacy system is actually good enough, we can actually make a robot we can send almost everywhere, like a Fukushima. And then we can also, we are also thinking about uh, creating a new transportation system. We're not going to compete with the wheeled vehicles on the flat ground. We're going to compete with the, uh, 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 we're going to uh, create a system that can go almost everywhere, all around. You know, cars are great and efficient, but they are constraining the road. We're trying to make a transportation that doesn't need road. It can go anywhere. So, for example, if you have a wheelchair user, they need to transfer, um, trans, uh, transition between their wheelchairs to their car. I, I helped one of my students, actually, who lost uh, uh, sensation below the abdominal muscle uh, by car accident, and she it was painful to watch, just like transitioning from wheelchair to car. And then if you have a develop a legacy system that can actually go everywhere with a great efficiency, we can actually have a, a system that can just ride on the right off the bat and then just go to the work, go through the stairs and uh, no matter like a, a cars and everything. So uh, and, and uh, many, many important uh, uh, application, we actually need a leg. So we started this project with the other two faculty members at MIT. I'm going to talk about uh, structures and actuator and then how we are going to do in the future. So this is a drawing five years ago. And this is a picture, actual robot picture, two years ago. And then this is a video uh, of running Star Moving uh, 2012. And uh, I'm going to talk about structure. Um, so this is the animal called uh, uh, Springbok. It it like just bounces like a literally spring, and they don't we don't know actually why they're doing this. But for <laughs> for mechanical engineer, that's fascinating. Why? Because their legs looks really flimsy, and then they don't break. You can imagine like this is a horse, half ton animal. Look at the ankle, and if you are a mechanical engineer, you can feel this bending moment. Oh, it's just stressful, literally stressful. And then they don't break. They just running like this all the time. And uh, do they, are, are they made out of like titanium and Kevlar? Well, not really. They are made out of two bones and tendons, same as your arms and uh, legs. And how come they, uh, they're so strong? And I was, uh, you know, if you think about the uh, aluminum, is about four times stronger than bone. Kevlar is about 20 times stronger than uh, our tendons. How come we cannot make this? I uh, speculate uh, there must be some secret. So if you think about robotic foot, if you apply force, you're going to have a lot of bending moment. But actually, Human are a lot more complex. I cannot even draw every piece. There are so many. So uh, I only draw like important parts. The, there are many, many bones. They cannot, cannot handle bending moment. But there are tendons at the bottom, so you can actually decouple. This is a hypothesis. Decouple the compression and tension separately. Then you can actually minimize this maximum stress. Huh? Is that true? It looks like actually true for horses, too. And then we tested it, actually, that hypothesis. And then we see this drastic stress reduction. And then we actually verify by experiment. And then this is only one example. I think we can apply this design principle we learned from animal and then make the leg much lighter. And then that makes the uh, locomotion much more efficient. I don't have a the whole lot of time to talk about actuator. Uh, but you know we've been uh, uh, dreaming about making, uh, developing artificial muscle so that we can make robot behave like this. And then. Uh, what are the uh, attributes? The, the, one of the challenges in actuator is there are too many things we need. So I'm going to just list what we need. We need a high force density. We need the high power density. Uh, we need the uh, high variability in impedance. This is a kind of like a recent a modern a notion where the manufacturers are stiff, cannot be compliant. Our arms are, I can lift quite a bit of force, but I can relax like uh, the nothing. This is actually really fascinating, something we cannot do. Our jaw can produce 4,000 newton or so, but I can be very relaxed uh, once you turned off. Um, high bandwidth, we need to be able to react quickly also. And then we, we like to be efficient so we can make locomotion system. And then it would be great if it's a soft. I think this is a probably future, uh, but we're, we're not there yet. But um, 
this is a torque speed curve. Uh, I cannot go through the detail, but the uh, one thing you can notice is like motor, electric motor can go up to 10 kilowatts per kilogram, and muscles are nearly 100 times worse. Like you cannot even, uh, uh, the most reliable data was like 100 watts per kilogram, which is about 100 times weaker than electromagnetic force, electromagnetic actuator. So many people think, well, electromagnetic electric motors are way weaker. It's much, it's not as good as muscle, so we cannot make this robot. It's the opposite. You, you gotta really open your eyes. Electromagnetic actuator, the power density wise, there's no match with anything else. Engine, no match. Our muscle is about 100 times worse than electromagnetic motor. The problem is they are not in the right uh, uh, operation condition. They are really, really fast, and they are not very strong. Oh, how about just gear reduction? You can use a high efficiency gear reduction, and then you can make stronger and then deliver all the power. That's where all this problem comes from. So we stop thinking about power at all. We stop talking about it in our lab. Like nobody talks about power density. You cannot actually measure power exactly of the motor. We start talking about torque. We need to actually deliver high torque so that we don't we get rid of all these heavyweight, high impedance uh, gearboxes so we can actually truly create an actuator that behaves like muscle. So our biggest question for the last four years was how can we achieve high torque density? So um, there is a, we, we did some like simple dimensional analysis, uh, geometric analysis, and then we found very critical metric, and then we found a non uh, trade-off direction, like a uh, direction we don't actually have a trade-off. It's always getting better. It's if you make this uh, dire dire uh, the radius between the magnet and the stator, and then actually all every aspect, every parameter actually gets better. So uh, that's how we pro uh, propose completely from paradigm. This is typical um, robotic joint. There are many gearboxes, uh, many gear, much gear ratio, and then there's small motor, and then have a very uh, stiff force sensor, and then you're trying to do force control. There's a non collocal sensing problem, the delay causing instability is a very uh, typical uh, problem. There are many people trying to add a spring, but still uh, managing the storage energy is actually quite tricky. Our new uh, uh, proposal is that, oh, if you make a robot uh, actuator very well, you can actually very minimize the transmission and then make robot uh, much more uh, versatile. So this is a quick video demonstration of impedance control. Um, there's no physical spring, there's no force sensor. Because I'll tell you why we don't need the force sensor. So uh, it's just making like a virtual spring between these two. And then now I turned off spring and turn on the damper. We can do this in millisecond. We have a wide range of uh, impedance. We can turn off like zero to uh, high impedance in a way that you cannot even move at all. It's like a, like a manufacturing robot. So. This has been possible for haptic devices in 20 years ago when, uh, when they, the force requirement is very low. It's very difficult to create in the large, uh, uh, high force range so that you can actually use for some sort of uh, work. So this is a combination of uh, that spring and damper. And you can crank up the gain uh, high enough so they can actually run and walk. This is a typically, typical gain for a high, high stiffness. Um, so there are multiple benefit out of this. Because of such a low uh, transmission impedance, we can actually regenerate whenever the leg is doing uh, uh, negative work. That actually increases our efficiency and uh, minimize actually like accident and breakage too. And this is something we can do because we, uh, uh, we don't have any force sensor at the foot, but uh, our robot can actually detect and then resync their uh, gate controller. So uh, why not having force sensor? Well, whatever we put it there is going to be destroyed in like a day or a half or in an hour. So it's very hard to create a reliable force sensor. And then if you think about yourself, you know, well, we we're relying on the sensor on our foot. Well, you think twice. If you have a, like really different shoes and then suddenly I, I tie a knot very hard and then you have to calibrate yourself to run, we're fine. We don't care what kind of shoes I have. I mean, if it's really uncomfortable, it's a problem. But our uh, control and balance actually rely on the muscle, uh, for the controller. There's a, a sensor right next to the muscle that's called the bulge tender, not necessarily uh, measuring some sense, uh, sen force sensor on the skin. Because it's not very great. It's, it's the, the sensitivity is in different domain. We uh, use mostly the muscle sensor to actually balance and control the force. So this is what we call the proprioceptive uh, force control. We can make much more simpler and much more robust. So we can, uh, using this sense sensor feedback, we can actually make a run uh, last year. Um, st 
still constrained in, uh, in, in the plane. So it can fall, it can go up and down, but it cannot fall sideways or it cannot turn. The treadmill is very narrow. Um, the trot gate is one of the easiest gates to realize that we use it, but it turns out to be a pretty efficient gate too. So you run up to uh, 14 miles per hour. That's the limitation of the treadmill. We don't know actually robust limitation at this point. Uh, treadmill was pretty bad. I was trying to um, transition to the gallop, and then uh, at that time, algorithm wasn't good enough, so it uh, went unstable. But this is actually what's happening, uh, and uh, if you look at the slow motion, and then uh, so the the one of the leg is actually detecting the uh, contact, and then re uh, map their, the rest of the controller so it doesn't go unstable. That's uh, one of the biggest stabilizing algorithm. And um, we actually try again with a different algorithm. Now we have an IMU and then have all this uh, body sensory feedback. Now we can stably uh, transition to gallop. And then you can hear this like typical galloping sound. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. And this is actually not the fastest gallop gate. Actually, there's a if you go faster, the gallop uh, gate changes and then have a double bounce. We need to do that uh, this year, so we're trying to make it faster. Um, so efficiency was, I said, is very good. So I'm going to talk to you about the uh, efficiency in in locomotion system. There's no real true efficiency. You know, any locomotion system efficiency, uh, rigorous uh, notion of efficiency is zero. Your car efficiency is all zero. Any locomotion, my locomotion system efficiency is zero. So that's why we come up with the call the cost of transport, which is similar to mileage. That's why we call mileage not efficiency of your car. If you go car dealer and then what is efficient of the car? You know, we talk on mileage, not we don't talk about 90% or something because uh, the, the, the nature of the transportation system. These are running animal. These are flyers. Lower number is more efficient because the cost is low. And then swimmers, surprisingly, swimmers are most efficient. This is a weight. It's a heavier weight tend to have a lower number in this metric. Human is really good. Human is very efficient. Uh, one of the uh, most advanced robots, Shimo, is pretty high. Hydraulic robots are way up there. They're spending a lot of energy just moving fluid out, in and out. Uh, this is real cheetah. It's actually pretty good, too. Our robot is right there right now. And then uh, we believe you can actually achieve about efficiency of a flying robot uh, because we actually didn't use all this uh, energy saving um, mechanism yet. And then our algorithm is nearly uh, optimal. But we, it shows that, well, the potential of legged system, can it be uh, effic as efficient as these cars? I think we can, we can do it in the next five years. Um, we uh, designed actually also motors to, to, uh, uh, to reflect our understanding. So the version 2 actually equipped the uh, motors we designed at MIT. So this robot is actually using different algorithm now. Uh, it actually has full state uh, feedback, and then it switched the controller between in the air and the ground. So now in the ground, it controls the force control. So you can actually dictate how long in the air or how long in the ground. So we can actually go outside, and then it can balance and left and right. At the time, the abduction degree motor is pretty bad. So we actually uh, uh, we Im implement new motors uh, just yesterday. So we'll see how, how far we can go. So we're trying to run outside this year. Now it has all the protections, and the robots get, get pretty beefy. Um, that's the state. And then this is actually the algorithm that uh, allows us to run uh, all the way up to three, three mile, uh, 33 miles per hour with a really impressive efficiency. So hopefully with the simulation, is uh, as close to what real thing. And we can make this happen in the real life. I will skip that video. I just want to show a different, completely different project. Uh, does anybody remember what this was? This is a, a, when I was a teenager. I loved the. Uh, this is one of the kind of best of music video. And then she was watching cartoon, and then suddenly the hand come out, and then it become real. So this was a fa the fascinating. I think this uh, uh, received some award, the uh, uh, music video award. But uh, uh, in our lab, we were participating in a project called the Printable Robot. So. We are actually uh, envisioning the same thing. Can we use a 2D-based manufacturing technique and then uh, create a robot out of this uh, uh, just cartoon uh, version? So this uh, layer of the actuator is actually also made by 2D, completely 2D. Uh, we have a 3D printers yet, but, uh, but no, none of these actuators actually can be printable. But these are actually 2D versions. So we just lay, have a structure layer. And then uh, actuator layer, and then we just combine it, and then that's all you need to do. 
So this ca price could be like a half a uh, half dollar. We're trying to make it even cheaper so we can actually make a pop-up book like hands coming out. We can control with the, your toys. So uh, this is a way to uh, commercialize the robot actually a very very cheap way. So running out of time, so I'm gonna wrap up their teams and important message you have to really extract the principle from the, this complex biological data and so we can go over the obstacles we can benefit uh, engineering design again this inspiration was important but the, I think I want to point out the biology really give us new perspective flying was a new notion when you don't see any flying animals right the flying is a completely new perspective that's actually more important and then principle matters uh, to realize it and then I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much.